a big breakthrough. I made a big breakthrough over Shabbos uh, about how to approach the next stage of our Messiah series. I'm not quite ready to unveil it. So maybe next week, maybe the following week, uh, please God, we'll get to it. Uh, but today I want to do the next installment of our Messiah series. Um, I'm sorry, the next installment of our um, ethics and mitzvah series. Um, it's fun stuff and we have a lot of stuff to go. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the whole summer of studying together with y'all. Okay, let's begin. <clears throat> everyone is on mute. Looks like it. Almost everyone's on mute. <clears throat> we are up to chapter six, Mishnah number six. This is the 48 ways to acquire Torah. And we're up to way number 23. You know, our sages, they're really experts on acquiring Torah, on acquiring wisdom. And it's kind of amazing that they organized for us 48 different ways to do it. And we're up to way number 23, Belave Tov with a good heart. If you have a good heart, that is a way to achieve wisdom. Now, what exactly does a good heart mean? It sounds very ambiguous. So the two questions we have to ponder are, what exactly are our sages intending when they say a good heart as a means to acquire wisdom? Number one, so what does it mean? Number two, how does it serve as a way to acquire wisdom as a means to acquire Torah? And in general, you know, we think about Torah and the way to acquire it, it's something that we do with our mind. It's something that we associate with cognitive means. A good heart sounds really nice, but it sounds like it's uh, emotions, it's feelings, it's it's social behavior. So how does a good heart serve as a way to acquire wisdom? That is our question. And I want to suggest today three different approaches. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive, but three different ideas of what it means in this context to have a good heart and how that can serve as a way to acquire wisdom, as a way to acquire Torah. The first idea is the idea of being joyous in someone else's success. When Moshe was commissioned by the Almighty to go save the Jewish people, he launches into a weeks-long series of objections. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want the job. He doesn't want the promotion. And this is told in chapter three and four of the book of Exodus. Moshe has been told, hey, God's selecting you to go save the nation. And all of us will be very eager to take that job. What, 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 what glory, what responsibility, what a legacy. And Moshe doesn't want it. And the real reason why he doesn't want it is because Moshe has an older brother, Aaron. And Moshe is worried that Aaron may feel a little bit hurt by the fact that Moshe, the younger brother, is getting this promotion and Aaron is overlooked. And when Moshe presents that argument to God, God says, Aaron? You worried about Aaron? When Aaron sees you, he'll be happy. He'll be glad in his heart. Aaron is someone that does not have even a smidgen of envy. And when he sees Moshe triumphing, he sees Moshe achieving this pinnacle, this apotheosis of career success. He's going to be happy, not just superficially, but even in his heart. And because of that, our sages tell us, Aaron merited to have the breastplate, the choshen, on his heart. Aaron is the prototype of having a good heart, where in his heart, he's happy for others. If we take that to the pursuit of wisdom, we can find perhaps one idea in what our Mishnah means when it talks about a good heart and how it connects to wisdom. Most of us, at least by default, we tend to be very protective, very motivated by advancing our own agenda, not necessarily the agenda of others. And we may get territorial about our own ideas. 
my idea is better than someone else's idea? What if objectively the other person's idea is better? Doesn't matter. This one's mine. And this is the one that I protect. This is one that I cherish. This is the one that I value. We're motivated. This is, of course, not a good quality. But by design, by, by default, we have the Eight Sahara. And the Eight Sahara says, no, you, your idea is better. And, and what you thought of is more, is more brilliant than what someone else thinks of. And to have a good heart, like Aaron, it means to be able to celebrate someone else's success, someone else's insight. If someone wants wisdom, and they're only using their own mind, they're, hand, they're, they're, they're handcuffing themselves. They're hamstrung at the pursuit of wisdom. There's only one mind that they could tap into to achieve wisdom. But imagine someone is receptive to other people's ideas and they're willing to accept other people's ideas with the same intensity that they accept their own ideas. They have a good heart. And they're always learning from other people. And they're like the wise person that the Mishnah earlier tells us, Ezel Chacham, who's the wise person? He who learns from everyone. They learn from everyone because they have a good heart. And they could stomach the idea that someone else's ideas have legitimacy as well. So someone with a good heart is willing to accept the triumphs of other people. That's someone that's going to be receptive to other people's ideas. And they're going to be able to achieve more wisdom than working as a lone wolf on their own. You know, in the yeshiva, the ethos of the yeshiva is very much oriented around this. Even the youngest, most junior of the students can challenge, not only that, is, is encouraged to challenge the great masters. When someone gives a lecture, it's open season. It's fair game. You have a great sage who authored many books, is a legendary Torah figure throughout the land. And once they walk up, walk up to the podium and they begin to present their argument, it is open season. You're allowed to challenge them. You're allowed to question them. You're allowed to scream at them if you disagree. And if you're right, they will accept it. Why? Because anyone who achieves that level of wisdom has a good heart and is receptive to other people's ideas. We're trying to find the truth. We're trying to find what the Almighty wants in the Torah. And yes, of course, there are 70 facets of the Torah. There are different dimensions of Torah. But if I can disprove your idea, you have to accept that. Why? Because we're arguing over the Almighty's Torah. There are many legendary stories of great sages who they present their idea in public. And there could be a thousand participants in the lecture. And someone from the back room, from the back of the room, gets up and says, no, you're wrong, and I could, do, I could, I could prove, I could prove it. And the sage will listen. And if indeed the questioner is correct, they will relinquish their claim. And there have been stories of great sages who closed their book and said, you know what, you're wrong, you're right and I'm wrong. We'll have to work through this again. That is a good heart. That's a heart that's able to be happy for other people's ideas. Don't, don't appeal to authority. No, I'm the sage, and who are you, some puny little kid? Who are you to argue with me? No. Even a small junior student has a say. And that's the idea of a good heart, or idea number one of a good heart, where you're able to amass ideas from everyone because you're happy for other people to have their moment in the spotlight, their 15 minutes of fame, their triumph in pursuit of knowledge and of wisdom, and that will be very beneficial for you to achieve wisdom on your own. Idea number one. Idea number two is a little bit more, a little bit more advanced, a little more sophisticated idea, and that is that the heart is often synonymous with our desires. We have to love God with all our hearts. With all your hearts. You only have one heart. 
if you do an autopsy or heart surgery, you will not find two literal hearts, two physical hearts. But in scripture, the heart is used as a, as a, as a metaphor for someone's desire, what they deeply want. And very often we have two hearts. We have the good heart and the bad heart, known as the Yetzer Tov, the good inclination, and the Yetzer Hara, the bad inclination. And we're told in the beginning of the Shema, we have to love Hashem our God with all our hearts, the good heart and the bad heart. Both of them have to love God. What does that mean? It means that even our quote-unquote bad heart can be made good, can be used as a means to love God and to advance the agenda of our soul. This is a big idea, central idea of our philosophy. We don't believe that you have to completely dissociate from something that the Almighty gave you. Everything that the Almighty gave you can be used to advance your spiritual agenda in life. Even the ostensibly bad heart can be made good. Of course, this is really what life is all about. Life is about overcoming, neutralizing, but even channeling the Yetzirah so it doesn't become an impediment to our spiritual advancement. In fact, it could even contribute towards our spiritual advancement. So if someone has a good heart, it means that the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, is not working against them in their pursuit of the agenda of the soul. We start off life, and we have a bad inclination. It's an unbelievable thing. A little bit of the primordial serpent is within us. It's a crazy idea. And it serves as a fifth column within our heart and it directs our life or at least it encourages poor decisions ones that will harm us in the long term and our objective is to wage war against this foe within us and if we have a good heart it means that the Yetzirah well, to the degree that we do have a good heart the Yetzirah is not operating within us negatively all this comes to play in the question of Torah. Torah is the Almighty's mind, so to speak. We have a very hard time connecting to the Almighty via theology, but his mind is transposed, so to speak, to frames of reference that we can understand in the Torah. Thus, we have an entire system of the Almighty's way of thinking that we can understand. We, we can read the Torah. Laws of commerce and interpersonal behavior, laws that we can relate to and understand. It's been formatted for human consumption. Unbelievable idea. And by connecting to, to Torah, we're adapting ourselves to the will of the Almighty. And we're upgrading our minds and our lives to be more in line, to, to conform with the will of the Almighty. And the more we connect to Torah, the more we become congruent with our soul and with the spiritual world. And this is the epicenter of the battle of the Sahara. Nothing undermines the agenda of the Sahara as much as the study of Torah. Nothing. In fact, the Talmud tells us, I created the Yetzirah, I created the Torah as an antidote. The exact opposite of the Yetzirah is Torah. And therefore, the Yetzirah is very threatened when we are trying to study Torah. Its empire is under siege. It's being threatened. And therefore, the, the real battle of our life is Torah versus the Eight Sahara. That's where it meets. That's where the two points are. That's the front lines. 
And this Mishnah reveals that there is a, a, a virtuous cycle here. I start off in Avi Sahara. Well, how, how do I overcome that? With Torah. But what happens as a result of that? As a result of that, every success, every triumph of Torah cleanses the bad heart and makes it a little bit good or less bad, but it moves it, inches it in that direction. And now I have a good heart, or at least relatively. It's, it's been improved slightly. Well, what's the result of that? Now that the Yetzirah is weakened, there's this virtuous cycle now that the study is easier. And thus the study becomes easier, and thus the heart becomes better, and that makes the study easier, and that makes the heart better. And that's the virtuous cycle. And that's the mitzvah. Every mitzvah drags with it another mitzvah that we read earlier in the book. So the Yetzirah does not want us to study Torah. And therefore, when we start, it's very hard, very difficult. It will launch every one of its tricks. It will deplete its arsenal, its repertoire of tricks, and it's got a lot of tricks to get us to stop studying, to prevent us from starting to study. Why? Because this is life and death, the Yitzhara. And that's why the beginning is very hard. The first step is murderously hard. But the second step is going to be easier. And the third step is going to be easier. And so on. It's going to get progressively easier and more enjoyable. Why? Because the heart has been remedied. The heart is now better. The Yitzhara's influence over a person and a person's heart has been diminished with every bit of Torah study. And that's this process that's being outlined in this picture. You have a good heart. How do you get a good heart? You got to improve the eight Torah, the bad heart. Why well, do you do that with Torah? And that feeds back to Torah study. Now it's a little bit easier because your opponent has been weakened, and so on. The virtuous cycle continues until the eight Torah has been completely cleansed, completely neutralized. And of course, that's a lifetime's work. But that's what we are mandated to do. This is a very advanced idea. We want to have a good heart. Well, what does that mean? We start off with a bad heart. Now, of course, we cannot be blamed for the eight Sahara that we have implanted within us. We didn't choose it. But that is a fact, a reality of all humans ever since the sin of Adam. And that's going to stop us or prevent us or try its hardest to prevent us from studying. And that's why it's really hard at the beginning. But once you start, you're improving the heart and thus you're making the subsequent study easier. And the more you have a good heart, the less resistance you face and the more you can connect to the Almighty's wisdom. So that's the number two. A good heart means a heart that's less under the thumb of the Sahara. And finally, idea number three, and that is that a heart is indicative of a person's actual reality. How a person actually behaves, how a person actually lives, how a person actually interfaces with the world. We really have two warring identities within us. We have who we profess to be, our stated preferences. And then we have the actual person, our revealed preferences. And those are not necessarily the same. We can profess to have very high-minded ideals, priorities, values. But look at how we actually live, and that is who we really are. What do we actually prioritize? What do we actually spend time and resources on? And those two may be, may be very different. The canonical example of that is Asaph. We know the story of Asaph, Jacob's twin brother. The Talmud, the Midrash, talks about how Asaph died. He died, he was trying to block the burial of Jacob in the cave of the patriarchs. And Jacob's grandson, Hushim, 
decapitated Asaph, and his head rolled into the cave. And our sages tell us that Asaph's head was buried in the cave of the patriarchs, and his body was buried elsewhere, either in Mount Seir, maybe on the grounds of the, the cave of the patriarchs area. That's where we're told about Asav's interment. On a spiritual level, what this tells us is that Asav, if you were to just isolate his head, just the stated preferences, what he professed to live by, he was worthy of being together with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and their respective spouses. He was on that level. In his head, Asav was a patriarch. The problem was that the rest of the body wasn't really in line, wasn't commensurate to the head. Those links that bind the mind, the head, to the body, those links were missing. And that's why his body was not worthy of being buried there. His body was buried elsewhere. And this shows us the, the, the conflict of our lives not just to acquire wisdom, to assemble wisdom in our head, but also to have that filter down, to have that penetrate our heart and our lives. And we have a mitzvah that's really de dedicated to, to trying to bridge that gap. And that, of course, is the tefillin. We don't have one tefillin, we have two. One in our head and one by our heart. And that's symbolizing the, the, the two prongs, the two stages of wisdom. Stage number one is to take the wisdom that is, of course, invoked in the scrolls of the tefillin and place it in our heads. But that's not enough. The next stage is to have that filter down to our hearts as well, to make our revealed and stated preferences the same. But in general, these are very different domains. You ask people, well, what are you living for? What's, your, what's the goal of your life? They'll say, well, my family and ideals, I have a mission, I have all these beliefs, I have these values. But then you say, okay, well, how, how are you spending your day? Well, it's work. And then you got to argue about politics. You got to watch your sports teams. And you have to watch your shows, entertainment, five hours of television a day. How a person actually lives may be very different from how they state their values and their priorities. What about God? What about your eternal life? What about the soul that will outlive your life in this world? How central is that? That may be an, an area where there's a wide gulf between your mind and your heart, between your stated professed preferences, and your revealed preferences. Our Sages tell us that the distance between the mind and the heart is greater than the distance from heaven to earth, which, parenthetically, the Talmud tells us is a 500 years journey, whatever that means. What we theoretically value and live by may be very different from how we operate in our hearts. We may have very lofty ideals in our heads, but in our hearts and our behavior and how we actually live our life, it may be very petty, it may be very low. What does it mean to have a good heart? A good heart means that whatever is good in your mind does not remain there alone. It gets passed on. It gets absorbed into the heart. A good heart means that the values, the ideals, the priorities, the agenda that we think of in our head is manifested as well in our heart. All the good ideals, all those values, all those priorities, they dwell in the heart as well as in the head. And this is, of course, an idea that's very valuable throughout our lives. 
But when it comes to study, it's paramount. When it comes to wisdom, it's paramount. We study the Almighty's Torah. We have to ask ourselves the question, where does that reside within us? Does it reside in our head alone? Or do we take the effort to take it to the next stage, to migrate it from our mind down to our hearts? My grandfather used to always talk about this image, this picture, this story of someone studying Talmud with great devotion. And he's studying the portion that talks about how important and how valuable and how cherished it is to lend money to a poor person in their time of need and distress. The Torah lauds someone who lends money to the poor when they really need it. And the person's studying it with great devotion and intensity, and he hears a knock at the door. And there's a poor person who wants a loan. He says to him, well, I got to talk to my wife. I have to see my accounts. I'm not so sure. Come back tomorrow. He finds a way to get rid of that menace, that pest, and goes back to the Talmud and studies with great devotion. This is an example. This is a picture of someone who may have a very good head, so to speak, but the heart has not yet been fully acclimated to the values of what they're studying. The verse instructs us, this is in Devarim chapter 4, verse 39. You should know, but you should also bring to your heart that the Almighty is God in the heaven above and on the earth below, and there is nothing besides, besides for God. Knowledge in your head, that's crucial, but so is the heart. And if your heart is good, it too, it too manifests, reflects the values that you've studied in your head. That will be helpful in the pursuit of wisdom of knowledge. When there's a gap, when there's dissonance, when there's a gulf between the head and the heart, The study itself is not as productive. But if we can shrink the distance, the gulf between what is in our head and what is in our heart, the mission tells us that the head itself will be more productive. Why? Because it's not just theoretical, abstract ideas. It's much more real. It's much more integrated. When we exhibit the values of Torah in our heart, in our behavior, in our revealed preferences, then the Torah, then the wisdom, finds a better home even in our mind. So we have an incredible Mishnah. One of the ways to achieve Torah, one of the ways to acquire Torah, to acquire wisdom, is to have a good heart. And we shared three ideas. Again, these are not mutually exclusive. Idea number one is like Aaron. A good heart means to, happy with the, to be happy with the success and the accomplishments of others, and that will result in us being able to learn from every other person that we encounter. Idea number two is that a heart, a good heart, means a heart that's cleansed of the eight Sahara, and that is the force that's trying to stop us from studying Torah. And the result of that is the virtuous cycle, where the heart becomes progressively more cleansed, and thus it becomes easier and easier to study. And idea number three is the idea of applied wisdom. It becomes much more real, much more integrated. It's part of you. It becomes enmeshed within you. The wisdom penetrates more deeper, more, there's a more intimate connection with what you study. And that paves the way for greater achievement in your studies as well. Way number 23. How do you achieve wisdom? Our sages, the, the greatest experts the world has ever seen in this, in this question of, of how to achieve wisdom, they tell us one of the ways is with a good heart. A good heart is a means to achieve Torah, to acquire wisdom. We'll pause for any questions.
Anyone wants to chime in a little bit here? I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, in the beginning, you were talking about the Yetzer. Mm -hmm. Yetzer Harar. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that a good heart, one who's genuinely operating off of the wisdom of Torah, a good heart, the Yetzer Harar in some aspects would actually end up working on that person's behalf, on the good oh, heart's behalf, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, we you mentioned it very briefly. That, that is. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I will tell you, uh, again, shameless plug, uh, this past week's Parsha podcast. Well, we spoke about it last week. Sorry. It was, was, it was with you all together. We did mention that idea that, you know, one of the ideas of sacrifice is to take the animal and to elevate it, right? To, to take the physicality, the thing that could be used against us, and to elevate that uh, uh, towards uh, towards God. Like a sin that, becoming a mitzvah. Well, yeah, when someone repents, right. uh, sin can be transposed into a mitzvah. It's an unbelievable idea. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank I you. Th I think Joe has his hand up. Joe, we're ready. Yeah, tell me if this fits, because... Uh... Just last night, I was driving home from uh, at least an hour away. It was pouring rain and dark out, and I was driving through Detroit, which is a cesspool of society. I stopped to get a bottle of water, and there's a little girl standing outside the gas station soaking wet in the rain. And she asked me for a ride home. And I was thinking on the one hand, I don't know if she's a prostitute or maybe she has drugs. Maybe she has a gun. And she wants me to drive her to inner city Detroit where I could get killed. But then on the other hand, I was looking at the pouring rain and here's this little girl asking me for help. And I'm like, Joe, even if you get killed, you're going to be doing it because you're helping somebody. And, you know, I was thinking about the Torah and Rabbi Wolby and what are the people of the group going to say? And I decided to drive her home. And uh, is that the good heart that you're talking about? Well, again, I, I, it's um, this is a, I, I will say, Joe. We would miss you. So please take care of yourself. <laughs> uh, but um, listen, that's a, a decision you have to make. Uh, you, you should not endanger yourself uh, to do a mitzvah. So if you feel like it's an actual danger, I think it's hard for, it's hard for, to give any you know hard and fast rules about this because uh, every situation is different. But if it's a situation that there's actual danger, I would advise against it. Um, but if you could sense that it's just the right thing to do and the danger is not... Uh, as real you know it's not really a, a palpable danger but of course that's that's a good heart that that's kindness yeah yeah well i guess you survived right <laughs> yeah go ahead david you're you're on mute though you're on mute you're still on mute There you go. There. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I have to say that of all the things that I've learned about in my journey, learn more about Judaism, you know, one of the most, it's got to be in the top two, uh, favorite things to learn about is the Yetzir Hurrah. And for those of y'all who haven't read it, read the rabbi's book because it's fantastic on on the subject but and it's one of the things that that when i when i do make it down to uh to houston for a visit i i, I want to corner you for a couple of hours and ask you questions about it because it really i really think that it's one of the keys to god's creation and and god's plan for us is how to deal with the yetzer hurrah and overcome it and as uh, as somebody was saying earlier, I think it was Rod, you know, turning the the Yetzer Harad to serve God, you know, as as the ultimate, you know, mm -hmm. um, perfection. But but anyway, I, I won't ask all my questions, obviously. But one of them is, 
I can't help. Yeah, well, first of all, my Yetzer Hurrah is like the strongest. <laughs> it's like the eight thousand pound gorilla, and and uh, and it's it's hard to overcome it and and fight it, but just knowing it's there helps. But um, it it's so much a part of me, you know, the temptations and the inner talk and the um, just the way that it operates on me. It makes it hard for me to think that it, it it's not melded into one with my soul. In other words, when I die and hopefully God willing go to alone, alone Habib, you know, I think there's teachings that you you know, your soul leaves your, you know, leaves the yet to hurrah behind. It's hard for me to see that. I mean, I think it's part of who I am. I think it's part of David Block. You know, if it wasn't for the yet to hurrah, I'd be a completely different, you know, um, well, being. Yet to hurrah, let's just clarify, you would be an angel. Exactly. You see right. any person that's not an angel? You know by definition that they right. have a yetzara. That's you know that's right. Uh, so 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 in soul. in Gan Eden, you know, will will we have our yetzara? Um, and I and and I think there's teachings that go both ways. That's a good question. Well, well the, the answer is no. The answer is no. Um, and but the the the, the reason why is because that is the definition of death. You know the, in you re referenced my book, so I could quote it. In chapter seven, I talk about how the relationship that the Yetzirah has with our soul, that's going to determine the kind of death that we undergo. The more enmeshed it is, the harder it is to you know disentangle, to remove the parts. So we talked about oh, that Lord. in the book. Oh, yeah. Lord. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had a, I had no, a, say a prayer a, for me. Say a prayer for me. <laughs> Well, no, it's not a prayer. It's not going to help. Yeah, you have to disentangle it the best, the best of ability now. Like that's your job. <laughs> that's literally your job right. now. That if we could just right. define our mission is okay. Let's try to remove as much of those binds as possible. Um, I actually, I must say, I had like a clever. There's a clever thing that I wrote there, but I, no one ever commented on it. So I'm like, I'm never sure if I if I write something clever, if everyone's like chuckles along with me, or if they just miss it. I'm never sure. Um, but um, so, yes, th that's the answer. That's answer number one. Number, number two is that we spoke about this um, in, in, you know, we spoke about the 13 principles of faith. There's something called Gehenna. And the objective of Gehenna is to remove all the uh, remaining influences and um, elements of the Yed Sahara from the soul. So it can be in Ganeitan. It can be in all of now again, the the soul may be diminished because that process, you know, that 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 process is the process of you know power washing the the Yitzhara off, you know. But the the, the someone cannot go to Olam Abba with the Yitzhara intact or in tow. There may be some scars, you know, um, proverbially scars um, of the Yitzhara, but the Yitzhara is not there. And and but but there, but we'll be reunited with our with our physical bodies, correct? Yes, um, but the physical body does not necessarily mean with the eight Sahara. Right. I just it's just it, it, it's 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 hard for me to think how the soul, <laughs> you know, would for lack of a better term, drive the physical body. Yeah, I thought that's one of the things that the Yetzirah well, kind of uh, David, it's not, functions that it serves. Is it's it not only hard for you, it's impossible for you to think about that. It's not possible for us because right. we, we were so under the influence of the Yetzirah. But I will tell you, there were people in history that lived their lives. They had a body and they had a soul and they did not have a Yetzirah. They did not have a Yetzirah. Um, they conquered it. They conquered it, or they, they did not conquered it. Uh, this is what Paul mentioned last week. They either conquered it and defeated it, or they transformed it. To Rod's point, they uh, they elevated it. Uh, and by the, those people are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. Four people were told about: Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David. And Moshe is even on a higher level, but Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David. They all had a body. And had a soul, and they did not have the influences of the Yitzhara. Mm -hmm. 
but to, to be continued. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> God willing. God willing. This is what makes the classes uh, so enriching, David, is those kind of questions. So um, Mark is asking in the chat, I'll, I'll get to David in a second. Uh, Mark is asking in the chat, tell us the clever thing that I wrote. <laughs> so I'll tell you the clever thing I wrote. So, you know, in, in the book, there's chapters and every chapter has a title and there's, there's sub chapters, like subheadings, you know, every different idea in a chapter, we don't, a chapter will have like, you know, four or five different sub chapters. Uh, so one of them, um, one of them, well, the one that was talking about the 903 different types of death that uh, we can undergo. And that is a reflection of the degree of enmeshment that the Yetzara has with the soul. Um, yeah. the, the subtitle uh, of that particular part of the chapter, I called it vigor mortis, which is a little bit of a play in words, like because part of the stages of death is rigor mortis. But vigor means like the strength of death. But the, so like Thomas says, there's 900 different degrees of death. I thought it was clever, you know? It was clever. Okay, there you go. I got me. There you go. It's, some, uh, it's a little bit, you know, one of those little things that most people don't even read. Most people I laughed. Read book I book. laughed. Book. Okay, there you go. I laughed. So right, the, and if they do, they don't read the subchapters. But I, I put it in just as a little wink and a nod, you know? That even though we're talking about like the degrees of death, we could still, you know, have a little pun, plan words, something like that. Anyhow, that that's it, Mark. It's not laugh out loud, hysterical, but you know, just to know we're having a good time or trying to have a good time while we study as well. Uh, go ahead. David. Well, it, well, it, I, I don't know if you're talking about another David, but I was just going to say on that point, it's funny, but it's also meaningful because if my Latin serves me well you know it means strength of death yes um, yeah. so so there is strength in death because we go through Gehenna and get scrubbed and some of us will be like a little bitty nub that make it. <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. All, all that's all we'll have left but that's that's the strength that, got, that happens through death <laughs> i love david's euphemisms <laughs> we're gonna show up in shemaim as a nub <laughs> that's good uh, go ahead, uh, other David. You have your hand up. So um, this probably has some relation to the, the the quality of one's heart. But we were studying yesterday in our family about the laws that are you know applicable to the the Noahide in relation to like the prohibition of blood, bloodshed and and pre preservation of life. And you know we have a lot of little ones in our house, and so a lot of interesting questions come up. Um, and we were talking about you know the permissibility of killing animals that cause distress to people. So that was one of the questions that was kind of posed to me, like, what about like, you know, uh, spiders and, and, and roaches or mosquitoes or things that cause us to stress, you know, what's the, is it, is it wrong to kill those animals or those creatures? Well, you, you know, you, you framed it really well. And the answer is no, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, we believe that the Torah prohibits causing any unnecessary pain to animals but it's unnecessary right if there's no benefit for us now i will tell you even going hunting is permitted by torah law sure you know even if you're not going to consume the animal you have no benefit from it you just want to have a good time it's for sport is it encouraged is it the best pastime it's not the best pastime best pastime is to study torah to do mitzvahs to do class to do kindness it's not the best pastime in the world but it is permitted why because it's not unnecessary it's for the benefit of a human. Uh, so similarly, the remov removal of nuisances, you know, to spray the bars or cockroaches or to remove the, to squash the spiders, nothing wrong with that. Uh, absolutely okay. It's a different class. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Um, can you please clarify uh, comic you made Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and David did not have the Yetzirah, but as I understand it, King David had a Yetzirah because he wanted to fornicate with that lady uh, Bathsheba, and then he killed her husband in the war. Wouldn't that be an evil inclination? Well, again, everyone is born with an evil inclination. Everyone, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David. But the objective of life is to fix it to the best of our abilities. 
to fix it by the very uh, many different ways that we can fix it. So it's possible that David at one point had the negative influences of the Yitzhara, and then he fixed it over the course of time. That's the easy answer. Uh, the harder answer is that maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, this is where I'm going to get myself into trouble because you'll ask for another clarification. But maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, what David wanted with Bathsheba and with her husband was not the product of the Eight Sahara. Maybe, just maybe, just maybe. That's a more advanced question. What exactly was David thinking? What was his rationale? We do know that the union of David and Bathsheba is a very central one because that produces Solomon and subsequent kings of Judah and Messiah. So we know that this is not just, you know, to use, not to use your words, but to, you know, um, uh, the, the way it can be presented on a simple level is that David just has runaway hormones, right? We do know for a fact that this union is one of the most important unions of the genealogy of our people and of the world, because it's going to produce Solomon and so on, the line that goes all the way to Messiah. So maybe David had some motivation outside of the Yitzhara in uh, that in the pursuit of that union. Again, it's much more advanced, but the simple answer to your question is that that there's a timeline, you know, he starts off with the Yitzhara like everyone else, and over the course of his life, like we're all encouraged to do, he was able to conquer it to uh, completion. Most of us will never get anywhere near completion. But we, we were told, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David are four examples of people that did arrive to completion. I always again, wondered. If they're the outliers. Go ahead. Sorry. I always oh, wondered if, if, like, there was a, if, if there was a part of that narrative in play where Bathsheba was a Jewish woman, but we know um, it was Uriah, he was a Hittite. If that was a mixed marriage and he hadn't converted, like, was that God's plan to kind of like deal? I, I with don't, it? I don't believe, uh, I don't believe that he was not Jewish. Maybe he was a convert. Uh, okay. I don't I know. Mean, I, I, I researched the history of uh, Uriah the Hittite, Uriah Hachiti. How does the Torah justify hunting for sport? Again, um, because we believe that there is a hierarchy. There's humans. And the animals created for, for our benefit. And therefore, we, are, we have no problem having leather garments. We have no problem having meat that we're eating. I'm eating the flesh of an animal. Yes, because the Almighty created humans. And then on a lower level is animals. So to benefit from animals, it's not a problem philosophically from the Torah's perspective. However, to benefit or to, to kill them for no benefit, that just breeds cruelty. You know, if someone's just, uh, uh, doing things uh, uh, just to harm animals, it, it, it's not good because it's going to make them a more harsh and cruel person. When it comes to uh, hunting for sport, because it is for the benefit of the human, it's for sport, it is technically permitted. Again, it's not the best pastime, but it's technically permitted because it's not needless harming, uh, killing of animals. It is for a purpose. You may argue that it's not the best purpose in the world, and I would agree to that. But again, the question is the technical the technical uh, um, prohibition will not apply in this case because there is a, a benefit for the human uh, who is enjoying themselves having sports. That's, That's a tough one. Well, again, uh, it, no one's saying that that is the best thing to do. I, 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 I deliberately presented it that way. It's not the best thing to do, uh, but it is not prohibited by the letter of the law. Because again, you are benefiting from it. The question would be, you know, what about uh, cockfighting or dogfighting or bullfighting? Are those allowed? I think, I think technically it would be allowed from the Torah's law. Because again, it's not done needlessly. It's done for sport. Again, are there better ways to entertain yourself? Yes, of course. Are there better pastimes? Of course. But is it prohibited because it's the needless uh, causing of pain and death for animals? No. Again, don't quote me as saying Rabbi Wolby says you should everyone go to bull bull fights and running of the bulls and you know shooting animals and hunting and you know cockfighting and not, don't quote me on that. But uh, I believe from the letter of the law it would be permitted. Okay, thank you. Now I will tell you I've never gone hunting in my life. 
I, I haven't either. <laughs> yeah. But I don't judge people that do because again, it's it's permitted by Torah law. I have to leave to Kabbalah class. I hate to leave. <laughs> okay, should we do the next Mishnah or should we, or should we should mitzvah or should we punt it to next week? What do you guys say? It's up to you guys. What do you ever all want? Give thumbs up. You want me to continue or you have to go? Thumbs up. You can continue. Three, four, one, two, three, four, five, five, six. Okay, so let's, let's do the next uh, mitzvah. Yeah, pe next. People that have to leave, we understand. It's not a big deal. Yeah, okay. Well, if you have to leave, you catch it on the podcast. No well, or you go to hell for not listening to it. But anyway. <laughs> Rod, <laughs> you are a troublemaker today. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll shut up. I'll leave my mic off. Okay, here we go. Go. So let's uh, everyone mute themselves and we'll get on to the next uh, mitzvah in our series. <clears throat> we are up to mitzvah number 131. Again, we are still in Leviticus, but we have reached a milestone in Leviticus in that we have finished the mitzvahs that are featured in the first parsha of Leviticus, Parsha Vayikra. And now we're on to the mitzvos that are featured in the second parsha in the book of Leviticus, Parshas Tzav. And this is a very interesting mitzvah, the clearing away of the ashes atop the altar. In the temple, in the tabernacle, there was an altar. Upon the altar, you would process sacrifices. The first sacrifice of the day is the carbon tamid, the daily tamid sacrifice. The last Sacrifice of the day is the afternoon, the daily afternoon tamid sacrifice. In between, you have all the other sacrifices that are brought, the ones that are obligatory, the ones that are optional, volunteer sacrifices. And then you have those two bookend sacrifices, the tamid offering of the morning and of the afternoon. And overnight, the animals, the sacrifices were burning atop the altar. This, by the way, mirrors the prayer schedule. We have the morning prayer that is a fulfillment, so to speak, of the morning tamid offering. The afternoon prayer is the afternoon tamid offering. And the evening prayer, which can go the whole night, that corresponds to the burning of the sacrifices done overnight. In the morning, there are a lot of coals and ashes atop the altar. Before the beginning of the day's services, before you start any sacrifices, we have mitzvah number 131. And that has to clear away the ashes from atop the altar, the ashes from yesterday, the ashes from the sacrifices of the day prior. Before you offer any new sacrifices, you remove the ashes of the previous day's sacrifices. This is done by a Kohen. He takes a special shovel. And he digs into the coals and he scoops up some coals that's been really, really burnt well. Ideally, not the coals of, of logs of wood, but really ones of animals, of sacrifices that have been really, really burnt well. And he scoops a shovel full and he walks down the ramp of the altar and he deposits the ashes near the altar in a designated location. In that place, there were other things like various feathers of birth sacrifices that were not burned. This is on the eastern side of the altar. And the Talmud tells us that these ashes would miraculously be absorbed into the ground. Now, the Kohen, this mitzvah, is only by taking one shovelful of ashes from atop the altar. What about the rest of the ashes that were present atop the altar? So they remain piled up. On the altar, they are moved to the side, as we shall see, but they remain atop the altar until it gets full. And then it's when it's time to clear it out, there's a sec a second process. There's not a, a standalone mitzvah, but there's a separate process called hotzah sedation to remove the ashes periodically. There was a complete cleaning of the altar. All the ashes were removed, and they will be placed outside the city, not on the floor of the temple, but outside the city, but this is not done every day, and this is not our mitzvah. Now, when the tabernacle was still being used during the course of the 40 years in the wilderness, whenever they transported the altar, they cleared it off entirely, but the mitzvah that we're talking about today, mitzvah number 131, that relates to the daily practice of removing a shovel full of ashes each morning. 
Now, the Sefer Chinuch, the book that we are using to study the 630 mitzvahs, and every mitzvah he gives us a reason, some idea that makes sense to us. Why would we have this requirement to remove a shovel full of ashes every day and then on occasion to remove all of them? That is to beautify and glorify the temple. The temple is about having a place where we can advance our relationship with the Almighty. And part of it, of course, is sacrifices and all the other things that were done in the temple. But it's much nicer when there's not so much ashes strewn about. It's more beautiful when the altar is cleaned, it's cleansed, it's polished of all the ashes. And he also adds, when there's, of course, a fire atop the altar, when there's so much ashes everywhere, the fire doesn't burn as brightly. It's influenced by the environment. So you clean it out and the fire burns better. These are two reasons that he offers us to make the temple a nicer place and thus a place that's more conducive. Rod to Bryant, Houston, Texas, USA to everyone. Remember folks, yesterday night Ooh. class is postponed for the fourth. I don't know if that, did everyone hear that or was that just me? Everyone heard it? <laughs> I think it's a new feature of uh, of Zoom that it, it, it accessibility anyhow so i'll, I'll uh, i didn't do that on purpose that must be new i think so i, I think, guess when somebody puts a chat in their question to you it'll read it i think it's only the host maybe oh sorry maybe, about that, no. much contrition and sadness for my interruption no worries uh, where were we <laughs> okay let's continue <clears throat> so we have two reasons here the, the temple is more beautiful when the ashes are, are cleared off. And then the, the impact of the location of, of the temple is going to be augmented. It's going to be more powerful. And also the fire will burn more brightly, and thus it'll be a more powerful fire. Now, as he always does, the Sefer Chinuch offers us a sampling of mitzvah. So again, every mitzvah follows the same pattern, gives us the basic idea of the mitzvah and the reason or a reason that can be palatable for us, and some sampling of laws. He tells us this is a priestly service, meaning it cannot be done by an ordinary Israelite. It must be done by a priest. And the priest must be properly attired, bedecked in the special garments of, of the priest. He wore the specially priestly garb. However, it's not the same priestly garb as he offered for service. Think about it. You know, you're going up to the, to the top of the altar and you're getting a bunch of ashes and you're shaking all the ashes about. You can imagine how dirty you would get doing that. So therefore, there is a separate set of garments that every Cohen had. It's the same garments, but they're old. They're maybe like a backup hair. You know, it's like when you, when you get your clothing dirty you say, okay, when I paint the house, I'll wear these, you know, these pants and this shirt. This is like my dirty clothing. It's the same clothing, but now it's a little tattered, it's a little ripped. It's the backup pair. The Kohanim, the priest, would have a backup pair of clothing. It's the same clothing. You have to wear the special priestly garb, but it doesn't be like the, the nicest one because you're, after all, going to get very dirty and you're going to be all, all full of ashes. And, you know, so you wear a separate designated garment to, to not get your other set of garments all dirty and soiled. It's not appropriate. Leslie Whitkov to everyone. Shalom. Shav Watov. Hope all of you are well. Everyone heard that, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, some... we're going to come up with new rules. Okay, go ahead. We have to ban the chat. <laughs> I'll figure a way to turn that feature. It is not appropriate for someone to do the work in the temple when they have soiled and dirty garments. And the example that he gives is that it's not appropriate to serve a master with soiled garments. You think of how in a restaurant you have the cooks, the line cooks, and they're all with the food and they're getting all dirty and sweaty. 
And then the waiters are all dressed, you know, to the nines. They have their bow ties, everything looks perfect. Because if you're going to present the food, you want to make sure that you're dressed properly. Similarly, if you're going to do the work, the service in the temple, you have to be dressed perfectly. When you're clearing out the garbage, so to speak, you wear your more soiled garments to do that service. Now, when is this done? So the Sefer Chinuch tells us that it depends. On a typical day, it's done at dawn. On festivals, these, these are busier temple days, it's done at the beginning of the last third of the night. You divide the night into three. And the beginning of the last third, so 67% of the way through the night, that's when it's done on festivals. And on Yom Kippur, the busiest day in the temple of the year, especially because there's only one coin to do all the work, we get started much earlier. It starts at midnight. And then he tells us how it is done. The Kohen that wins the lottery, not the lottery, as we shall see, the Kohen who wins the lottery to be the one to remove the ashes, they first must immerse in a mikvah. And then they get dressed, again, in the backup pair of clothing. And they wash their hands and feet from the key or from the laver. And the other Kohanim would warn them not to touch the pan, don't touch the shovel, until you wash your hands and your feet. The shovel, by the way, is made of silver. And the Sefer Chinuch gives us the exact location of the shovel where it's typically placed. It's on the west side of the altar, between the altar and the ramp. He takes the shovel, and he ascends the altar. And he arrives, and there's you know the smoldering heap. There's still a fire. There has to always be a fire atop the altar. But yesterday's sacrifices are now coals. But he maneuvers the coals, moves them to and fro this way and that way until he scoops up some coals that are really, really well done. And he takes in the shovel and he descends the altar down the ramp. And instead of turning south to the west side of the altar, he turns north to the east side of the altar. Let me clarify that. I think, I think I misspoke here. And it's, instead of making a right turn to go to the west side of the altar when he walks south down the ramp, instead of making a right turn, he makes a left turn and goes on the east side of the altar north, walks about 10 cubits to the designated spot where the ashes are placed, places the ashes and the coals on the floor. And again, this is where the other items were placed, the feathers of the birds and the leftovers, the ashes of the inner altar and the ashes of the menorah. And this is the daily mitzvah of the Truma Sadeshin, of the removal of the ashes. And afterwards, the Kohanim will, all of them will go up on top of the altar. Of course, they have to wash their hands and feet first. And they would take shovels and forks and they would pile up the rest of the ashes, not that one scoop full, the rest of the ashes. They would put in a designated spot atop the altar. And then when that gets filled up, they will load it up into a large copper vessel, load all those piles, those mounds of ashes into a large copper vessel, and it will be transported outside the camp, outside the city. This is a very interesting mitzvah. The first activity done in the temple every day, the removal of the ashes. And again, there are two types of removal. The mitzvah is one coin who wins the lottery with the shovel and following that specific designated process. And then when it really, really loads up, when the ashes really are overflowing, it would all be removed, but that's not the daily mitzvah 131. Now, this is a really interesting part of the daily tabernacle and temple protocol. And the Talmud tells us that there's a reason why they had to do a lottery. You think about it, you know, there are a lot of jobs in, in, in a house that people really like to do. You know, they want to cut up the steak or, or, or they, they like, uh, my kids like to sweep the floor, but not to like scoop it up, just to just to move around with the broom. But to take out the garbage, that's not as coveted. People don't want to do that as much. But the temple's garbage, so to speak, to remove that was a highly coveted activity. And all the Kohanim wanted to do it. 
and they instituted a lottery because previously they had a different system and that was a race. First come, first serve. But there were some tragedies that happened and they switched it to a lottery system. The Talmud tells us there are actually two stories. One of them is an incredibly wild story and one of them is also a, a sad one. There were two store, there, there, were, there were two Kohanim who were running up. It used to be that whoever got up first, they would do it. So the, the Talmud tells us that there were two Kohanim, and they're both running up the ramp. And they were about to, it was neck and neck. And one of them pulled out a knife and stabbed the other one in his heart. He was so committed to get to get it first. He murdered the other guy. So the Talmud tells us that it, it really was a crazy story because you cannot have a dead body in the temple. And the father of the murdered person was also present. And he says that the, 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 his own child was dying and he's thinking, well, that the child's not dead yet and therefore the, 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 the knife is not impure yet. And therefore, we could pull the knife out and there wouldn't be impurity conferred to the knife. Well, the Thomas said, this is a crazy, crazy story. Like, you think about how crazy it is. First, the guy stabs him and the father's worried about the purity of, of the knife. And the commentaries there tell us that this is right before the destruction of the temple, or it was at some point before the destruction of the temple where the sanctity of life was diminished in the eyes of of the people, and the father of the person who's being killed is more concerned about the purity of the knife than the death of his son. But this did not change the policy. Uh, this story, this crazy story, the, the coin who did it was obviously a little crazy, a little cuckoo. He was mentally unwell, and therefore this was not enough to get them to change the policy. But there was a second story the Talmud tells us. Again, a close race down to the finish line, and there was no murder that happened there. Instead, one of the contestants shoved the other guy off the altar, and he tumbled down the altar, and he broke his leg. And this, the Kohanim reasoned, this is something which could happen again, and therefore they changed it to a lottery system. We're not going to have this mayhem of uh, free-for-all it's going to be a lottery system. Any Cohen who has never had the privilege of offering, of, of doing this service, of removing the ashes, they were a candidate. And everyone would put up one finger or two fingers and they would throw out a number and they would count. They would have a lottery system to find out which Cohen is going to do this mitzvah 131 of removal of the ashes. Now, I will tell you that a couple of years ago on Parsha Tzav, I recorded a Parsha podcast on this subject, on this ceremony of the removal of the ashes and the secrets that are there. I, there were a bunch of interesting questions. I'm not going to go through everything that we talked about, but maybe you could find it and, and listen to it. The title of the podcast is Parsha Tzav, Ashes, Ashes, We All Rise Up. And the questions that I posed were, you know, what's the point of this mitzvah? Like, you, you, there's a lot of ashes there, and you want to clear them away. We get that, but you only remove one shovelful, number one. Number two, why is this so desirous? All the kohanim are clamoring to do this mitzvah. And they, they, one guy even did a murder because of it. And the other guy shoved the guy off the, uh, off the altar, and they had to do a lottery system. Everyone was so desirous of it. What's the idea? And question number three was, you know, typically the, the direction in the temple is things go on top of the altar. The animals go up on the altar. Things are brought to the altar. And here we have the opposite process. Things that are on the altar are removed from the altar. There's got to be some symbolism behind that. Why are we taking these ashes? And there's a mitzvah to take them from the altar and bring them in the opposite direction to remove them off the altar. Typically, we think of things to go there, not to be removed. So what's the secret of it? So I will tell you to listen to it. I think it was uh, quite uh, interesting. Um, what does it represent? Why is it so cherished? 
and what is the idea of taking it off the altar. I will share with you one idea. This is, I'm not sure if we mentioned that in this podcast, but this is a famous idea on this notion, on this mitzvah. Think about it. The first activity done every single day in the temple, the very first thing that we do, you take some ashes and you take them off the altar. Those ashes represent what we did yesterday. Before you start working on today's project, you remove some bit of yesterday's accomplishments. There's a famous essay by Rav Hirsch where he elaborates on this point. There's the importance of looking forward. We tend to, if we have a great day yesterday, we, we like to coast on, on the previous day's successes. And you can become very complacent. You could kind of reach a plateau and say, well, I did some great stuff yesterday. Today I could take a day off. It's important to remove a little bit of your association with yesterday's accomplishments so that you can begin anew. Because if you are just happy with what you did yesterday, that's going to be the enemy of future progress. So if there's a mitzvah, to remove yesterday's mitzvah, to kind of dissociate yourself from what you accomplished yesterday, not everything, because you're you're still building on yesterday's accomplishments. You don't remove all the ashes, but you have to symbolically start from scratch. On one hand, you perpetuate some of the great accomplishments of yesterday and yesteryear, but you also remove a little bit so that way you can start from scratch, start from fresh. You're not born anew every day. You're building on yesterday's accomplishments, but you don't want to rely on it and to become complacent and to just say, well, I did already enough. If you're still alive, you still have much to do. This is Mitzvah number 131, the ashes of the altar. To remove them every day, a shovel full done by the Kohen, wearing the special ashes garments. And this is Mitzvah number 131, to remove the ashes from atop the altar. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I hope to get an email from you with a question or comment or feedback and to hear from you soon. The email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Okay, let's uh, everyone chime in here. Does this still make noise? Uh, I guess if somebody types something into the group, it'll read it out loud. So just remember that, guys. Bruce asked, do they go to the mikvah and change clothes after the ashes work? Um, do they go to the mikvah afterwards? Uh, the Sefer does not talk about that, but... Um, Trying to remember what the process is. Um, mm, 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 I remember they have to change, but I don't remember how that process works. I don't think I don't know if they need to. Really? I guess it depends on what their job is for the rest. Of the <clears throat> well, before they walk into the temple, they always have to wash. Go to bed for wash their hands. Right. Uh, wash their hands and feet, change their clothing. Yeah, they wouldn't need to change their clothing to do any more work in the temple. Right. But I don't know if they would need to go to the for again. I don't think I think answer I don't think that the answer is yes. Maybe yes, but I don't think so. Rabbi, is there any coalition between the ashes, removing the ashes, sort of some level of representation that there is a removal or the the removing of 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 that which re represents you being put on the altar, right? The animal, and you're removing the ashes is almost like when you do truva to remove the past from what you have done chuva over does that have any I, I i love that it's a very advanced idea that you're saying and i think there's a merit to it i think there's merit to it um there's a lot of merit to what you just said but it's much more advanced there's a lot of secrets with ashes <laughs> a lot okay. of secrets i'll tell you a lot of secrets so i have you'll do it you're going to do an ashes this. class from ashes to ashes dust to dust well abraham said i'm but dust and ashes we have the ashes of the red heifer right that Talmud said, the, yeah the, yeah there's a lot of secrets of the ashes a lot of secrets so yeah absolutely 
Okay, anyone else wants to chime in here? Joe's in the queue. Joe, go ahead, Joe. Thank you, Rabbi. Can I draw you outside of today's uh, mitzvah and back to an issue that might touch on the Messiah series? Sure. Um, last month, according to my notes, you were mentioning two potential outcomes. One was a meritorious outcome. One was a non-meritorious outcome. Yes. And this morning, um, Rod, my uh, friend and colleague, and I were dialoguing on whether things are getting better or not. And I think we had a slight difference of opinion. According to the online report, Christianity is growing at 1.17% growth rate. So they're growing bigger and bigger, whereas Judaism is only growing at 0.63% gross rate. So it's not growing as fast. In your opinion, do you think that Judaism is getting surrounded by more and more Christian beliefs? Is that a not fair? So that that doesn't measure uh, quality, right? That just measures, you know, quantity. Um, so I would say that the intensity of of uh, the intensity of the uh, religion um, may be a factor, but I, I don't think the Messiah yeah. is going to deal with you know statistics. The you know one you know, one percent growth or two percent growth. You know, the, 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 I'm not sure that the Messiah is going to worry about that. Um, because it's not a process, it's not, it's not a result of some sort of um, demographic, you know, process. We, we talked about this, of course, in 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 a few different ways, but there is an there is an element of of the Messiah which is very rapid and very and very dramatic. Um, so revolutions uh, are, are are comprehensive. You know, what percentage of Russia did uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks control in 1912? You know, zero. And how much they control in 1922, all of it, you know, again, not to compare Messiah to Lenin or the Bolsheviks, don't misquote me on this, but the point is, is that a revolution changes everything all at once. So if the, if the, mess, if the messianic transformation is going to be a form of a revolution, uh, you know, the incremental changes that happened beforehand may not be material. Who else wants to chime in here? Hey, Rabbi. Well, we just real quick. I, I found a book on Amazon. And I, you, you referenced your grandfather a lot. And I just wonder, I, I put in the chat a picture of a, a book. I just wonder if that was your grandfather that you, you speak of from time to time. I don't see it. I don't see the chat here. Oh, it's called, uh, I, I pasted a picture of it. It's called Rob Wolby on Chumash. Yes, that, that that is a compilation of some of my grandfather's teachings on the Chumash. Yes. Very cool. Okay. Highly recommended. Who else wants to chime in? Please, please, please. Sandy, you better go. Sandy, Sandy, Sandy. We want to hear from you, Sandy. Well, I have one question. And it goes back to the good part. How did you know that is exactly what I needed to hear today? I've been studying you. I've been studying you. That's how. Yeah. It, this happens a lot. It's, it, it, um, this is the handiwork of the Almighty. It's not me. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't um, monitor you that closely. <laughs> well, it does help that I slip you a few bits of. Yeah, that helps. Bits, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, the the part about um, the gulf between my stated preferences and what I actually do really it, it, that's, that speaks to everyone because everyone really, has that. really hit hard. So it was tough to hear, but thank you for saying it. Well, I'm I'm glad it was uh, beneficial. But it did you don't feel bad because you're not you're literally not the only one. You're, there's no one who is does not have that. This, well, no one who's trying to improve their life has that. This ha, avoids that. That that's a definite by definition. Anyone who wants to improve is going to have to overcome that 
well that's that is the work the word work is to kind of bridge those bridge that gap so yeah absolutely and just a, a follow-up comment to what joe's statement about the percentage of christian christianity growing over judaism coming from christianity and being involved in the inner workings of more than one church uh, i understand the main purpose one of the main purposes of a church is numbers we've got to add numbers to the role so they're out there actively recruiting my understanding judaism doesn't do that so yeah, we, we can't well. really say the percentage is this and it's outpacing judaism because you're you're not comparing the same things mm -hmm. yes 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 Joe, your hand is up. Is that because you didn't take it down or? Um, no, I put it back up because our blessed rabbi asked for more comments. And this might actually touch on what Sandy just said about the, the dynamics between, and what I said, the dynamics between Christianity and Judaism. Uh, rabbi mentioned the second issue that he raised about the good heart is that, and I just made a note that the primordial serpent is a pillar somehow. And I was wondering where did the origin of that idea come from? Because it, it does that, I did, did that come about like in the 1500s or does that go back before Christianity, because I'm beginning to view Christianity could be a great way to learn about something that's wrong, that's not good to do, that Christianity itself could be a Yetzer Hurrah, where we learn that it's, that it's all a big mess. And I'm wondering, maybe this concept of the good heart originated before Christianity, does that make any sense? Of course it comes before Christianity. Christianity is a relatively new religion from our perspective. It's, it's brand new. <laughs> you know, Islam is even newer. Hey, Joe, do you know why uh, God created Mormons? So, so Christians know well, how Christians Jewish people feel. Christians know what it's like to have their scriptures corrupted. <laughs> I see it. Yeah. And and that's and is also christianity came around to show uh people jewish people off the derrick on what's wrong with that religion i mean even somebody that's off the derrick can figure that one out but rabbi i really appreciate you doing this on your vacation hey, i mean cool. you're you're who rich sent him on vacation who sent him on vacation? Well, vacation i know you're not but the kids are and the wife is yeah, but they were great. They were quiet in the background. Beautiful. They did a good job. Yeah. I kicked mine out to the pool, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so please, I'll see everyone next week, right? Or Hashem, yes, remember tonight's class, 14, uh, 1300, wait, 1500 hours or three o'clock. And then we have uh, Tuesday night's class is been rescheduled or canceled because of the 4th of July. For all you people shooting guns in the air in Texas, you'll enjoy it. So until then, Sandy, do I have any other admins that I forgot? I have forgotten. I think you covered it. Beautiful. See you guys this afternoon at Tree. Karen, it's good to see you. Charlie, Ben, James, Mary, Mark. You guys take care. Shavuot Tov. <laughs>